Hi guys, this is Mr. Wheeler. This lesson is on applied genetics. So as humans, what control do we have over the genetics of other species populations? And when we're talking about human influence on other species, this is called selective breeding. Selective breeding is when we're trying to get desired traits of certain plants and animals and we are selecting them and passing them on to the future generations. This is through controlled breeding, um, and there's two different methods that uh, we could implement for selective breeding. There's hybridization, and then there's inbreeding. The difference, or the main difference between hybridization and inbreeding is that hybridization, we're trying to take traits and combine them so that uh, the, the new organism or the new population has the better traits. Whereas inbreeding, we already have the better traits and we're trying to maintain those desirable traits. And so um, maintaining desirable traits, some examples would be if you have like a line of race horses that they're champion horses and you want the progeny to also be champion horses because they have value that way to the horse owners. So you wanna make sure that you're inbreeding those horses so that you always have that, those fast champion horses same with dogs. If you uh, want a desired breed of dog, you're going to inbreed those dogs so that they have the desired traits. Um, you can do this with crops too. This is done um, so that the crops have the desirable traits of uh, growing faster, being more disease resistant, drought resistant. And so um, inbreeding, you're maintaining the traits. Hybridization, you're crossing them. You're trying to combine the best traits so that maybe someday you could inbreed those to maintain the traits. The problem, well, each one, each one of these types of selective breedings, uh, they have their own problems. So hybridization, the problem is that it's time consuming and expensive to finally uh, get your population to true breed so that you can cross them. Um, it takes many generations to get to that point. And the problem with inbreeding is that every time you inbreed the, the organisms, you're going to uh, increase the chance that you're going to develop a homozygous recessive offspring and that homozygous recessiveness might be for a trait that could be bad. Um, for example, colorblind, um, that's a bad trait, or some type of defect. And so normally the individuals will have a, an extra copy, but if you keep on inbreeding the organisms, uh, that extra copy might breed out and then you'll be left with a defective gene and that could be very bad for the organism. So here's an example of inbreeding. And so if we have generation zero and the desired traits are the light blue traits, and you can see in this population we have some of the violet colored squares too, which are the traits that we don't want. And so for inbreeding, we would just only breed the blue ones. So we're trying to get rid of that purple, uh, whatever trait that might be, that purple gene. And so in generation one, we're going to have less of that purple gene take the blue ones again, breed them again. Generation two, even less of the purple gene. We're maximizing the blue gene, minimizing the purple gene. We're trying to get that one type of trait. Generation three, generation four, and hopefully by uh, a, a sequence of generations, in this case, the fifth generation, we've bred out the undesirable trait and we've made it so that we have just the desirable trait and this, this organism or this population is now true breeding. It's, they're all, we could assume that they're homozygous at this point. That'd be inbreeding. For hybridization, it's gonna start off very similarly. You are trying to get your population to true breed. You can see that I'm separating my populations with a vertical line here. Um, so in the, in the left population, we're trying to get rid of the dark blue navy uh, traits. And in the right population, we're trying to get rid of the red traits. Eventually, we're going to get both populations to be true breeding, at which point we could then cross them and come up with hybrids. And so um, once we have generation four, that are homozygous for the desired trait, doesn't have to be generation four, just in this example it is, um, we're going to get the organisms to be true breeding. Once they're true breeding for the traits that we want, we can then cross them to get our hybrids. Okay, and that last generation is the hybrid generation. Um, years ago, NPR did a story on um, the history of hybridizing our food, and they, they pointed to 
these paintings from the 17th century and how the fruit, especially the watermelon, look different uh, than they do in current times. And so you can see, if you look at these watermelons, uh, we can apply that these watermelons have been hybridized over hundreds of years to be very different than what they used to be. And so you could see in this image, we have these watermelons. They don't look like the watermelons of today. We see that they're segmented, much like a citrus would be segmented. The seeds are very large. The outside of the watermelon looks very foreign. Here's another example of the watermelon. Again, very different from uh, what we have today. So that's just one example of um, how we've hybridized something. Um, when it comes to hybridization, uh, or when it comes to selective breeding in general, it's humans manipulating a different species to get what we want. Finally, the last, things, last thing for this section is to understand what a test cross is. And so what test cross allow us to do is they allow us to analyze uh, what genotype we have within our population. And so previously we were looking at populations and we we're trying to get them to be true breeding, to be all homozygous. But how do you know if they are all homozygous? You can't always assume that they're all, especially if you have a small population. And so what you do is you take an individual that you know is homozygous recessive and you then cross them with the unknown individual. So with the unknown individual in this case, it would be the top genotype. And so either the unknown is homozygous or heterozygous. And to determine whether they're homozygous or heterozygous, if you want to use your known homozygous recessive individual, and you will then see what the progeny are. And so if your progeny are all the same type, and so you can see in this top, this top square, all of them will have the same phenotype. They'll go, they're going to all have that dominant phenotype. That tells us that the unknown genotype at the top must be homozygous. The individual must be purebred. Whereas on the bottom, you could see that half the offspring are going to be that dominant trait, and then half the offspring are going to be the recessive trait. That proves to us that this unknown genotype is going to be heterozygous or um, hybrid. And so that's a way that we could determine the genotype or infer the genotype, uh, and that's by using a test cross. And so that's it for this short section on 13.1 Applied Genetics.